Uh, Taggart, uh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we're just going to talk about uh, a little incident that occurred uh, yesterday, uh, which I didn't know anything about until I had a meeting. And somebody said, did you know that the, the 100 mile treadmill world record was broken on Zwift yesterday? And I went, no. And, and here we are. Uh, 24 hours later, and I'm talking to Taggart. Taggart, tell me about your surname. I love your surname. My my name is Taggart Manetton. I am 25. I'm a PE teacher and an ultra and an ultra marathoner. So, have you done have you done any uh, family history uh, about your surname Manetton? Um, I know it's Welsh. I I think it's Welsh. Uh, that's that's about all I know. I I couldn't really tell you much to be honest. So. Do you know anything? Uh, when I first heard it, I, when, when I first heard it, I thought, oh, guy, a Dutch guy has broken the, the hundred mile world record. So don't know he's from Illinois. Okay. <laughs> That's <We're>, funny. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, you're, you're 25, 25, 26, 25? 25. You're 25, and you come from, you're from Illinois, born and bred Illinois? Yep, uh, born and bred in the cornfields here. Farm Tell boy. me, uh, you're a farm boy. Okay. So, well, how did you get into running as a farm boy? Well, um, originally I was a wrestler. I wrestled when I was a kid and, uh, you know, in wrestling practice, you run a lot. So then my senior year, I decided, you know what, let's go out for cross country and track. And long behold, that was my true love all along. So when I was 17 years old, I, I first started running and fell in love with it. Just like most people do. Okay. So you, so, so about around about 16, 17, you, you kind of started to, to run um collegiate stuff did you track so i had a very short collegiate career where i actually um hated running for a while i got very injured quickly and um i ended up in triathlon when i was a junior in college my third year so i saw um because uh, obviously I did a little bit of snooping. Uh, yeah, you did. Um, so you did a pretty good uh, sprint triathlon time uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, I, I got into a really good triathlon training. Like I said, I was a junior, senior, and then a little bit post collegiate career. I was only running like twice or three times a week, and and um, a lot of my well, all of my triathlon cycling was on Zwift which was really nice. And I actually got very strong on the bike from Zwift races. I wouldn't even do bike workouts. I would just sign up for like a, for like a, for like 30 miles on Richmond and I'd get done for an hour at like 320 Watts and I'd be smoked. And then, um, you know what? and then I, I, I'm convinced. And then I'd hop I'm off convinced. the bike and run three miles. <laughs> and then I'd hop off the bike and run three miles, you know? I am convinced that nobody does workouts on Swift Riders. I, I'm sure they, they just all race, and that's how they do their, that's their, their training. It's all racing, isn't it? It, it? it totally is. It got me in the best shape, you know, because, because with the A racing, I'd say the tempo is like 280, 290 watts for me, and then the sprints are 400, and, 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 and like you do that for an hour, you're burning 1,000 calories, and you got like, 80 TSS points on training peaks and bada bing, bada boom. Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, there you go. So I miss it. You, do you, <laughs> it's so you say you miss it. So you don't cycle very much on Zwift anymore? Um, since I turned into ultra running, I, I primarily run in my off season in December. I did some Zwift racing just to stay in shape and just to uh, get my heart rate up. But uh, now that I'm just running, no, um, I, I do not, unfortunately. I just don't have the time to. Since so, I run so much. Same, same here, to be perfectly honest with you. My bike has gone in place of another treadmill next to me. <laughs> <laughs> so when did the change happen? When did the change happen from uh, triathlon uh, to just running and then ultra running? So in November 2019, I ran a marathon. I did uh, 237 from like 20 miles a week of running uh, with a lot of triathlon training. So then I decided in 2020, I would chase eventually a, uh, a United States of America Olympic trials qualification, the marathon in 2023 and OTQ. So because of everything that happened in 2020, I never got my chance to run a marathon. So around like July, it was, it was like May to July, I went in this huge base training phase, just hoping for a fall marathon and, and it never happened. 
And then finally, once my fall marathon got the official cancellation, I just, I was, I was just kind of speechless. You know, I didn't know what to do. I was running 120, 130 miles a week. And that's when I was like, I'll just sign up for my first ultra. So I signed up for the Tunnel Hill 100 miler that was on November 14th of last year. And I trained my butt off for 16 weeks for it. Let, let me just go back to something you said right at the beginning there. Okay. So you did your first marathon in 237. Yeah, off from 20 miles 20 a week. 20 miles a week training. Uh, I'm, I'm not broadcasting now because uh, there was a lot of cycling and swimming uh, in there. There was a lot of cycling and yeah, swimming in there. Because so. I'm telling well, you, wanna, if you want to break three hours for a marathon, you've got to be doing at least 60 miles a week, 100K a week, you know, or, or you're not going to break it. I mean, there's, there's different ways to do things, aren't there? And like you say, you did a lot of cycling, a lot of swimming, and that will all help with your aerobic base to get to the, you to the level that you needed to be. And also, let's not forget talent, you know. Some people have it, don't they, really? I kind of credit Zwift Racing to uh, work those muscles that I wasn't when I was running, you know, that um, that uh, made my uh, quadriceps really strong that could handle the beating that they took on that day in 2019. So I did I did a lot of hard cycling, and, and I was swimming 30,000 yards a week on top of that. So Oh, wow, but, okay. Yeah. So you've been I, putting I, in the hours. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, oh yeah. I was putting in probably 20 hours a week of triathlon training, which is very tough training. So. But listen, you're, but, you're 25. You should be out nightclubbing. You should be drinking with the boys. Why, why are you, why are you putting in 120, 130 miles a week training? What is it about your personality that makes you do that? Well, now I'm training a lot higher. Uh, that was just back at the first of the year in 2020. Um, I'm not saying I don't go out with the boys to the clubs on an occasional Saturday night, but um, I don't know. It's just like I have this all or nothing personality. You know, I can't be I can't be at 60 or 70 percent. It's either it's either 100 percent or or like off season, pretty much. You know, um, I just I just can't see myself wanting to pursue this dream of someday, you know, eventually ultra marathon records and, and, an, and an Olympic trials qualification and only giving myself 70% of the effort or 80% of the effort. Uh, did you have any encouragement from your parents? Were your parents sporty types? Um, how have they helped in your, in your development? My dad in eighth grade was a five minute miler, uh, which kind of helps my genes a little bit, I suppose. But um, when he got into high school, he was too cool to run and he just played baseball and basketball. Um, my mom, my mom wasn't very athletic, but uh, both of them, ever since I started uh, uh, distance running, have been very supportive uh, towards me. So, I mean, uh, like even to this day, I don't, I don't live at home, uh, but my mom still cooks my meal. She meal preps for me and brings it over. You know, she, she does everything she can to accommodate my training just because it's, it's so tough when you're running 200 miles a week because you have no free time at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, believe me, wait till you get kids and a wife. <laughs> that, uh, uh, that is a ways off for me right now. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, but, that, that but is. The good thing is, though, in, in about 10 years' time, you'll swap your mum making your meals and crewing for you to your wife making your meals and crewing for you. That's, that's just the way it works. Um, exactly. Um, yep, yep. So we get to November 2020, and you enter this race i guess before the race i should say one quick thing for 16 weeks i averaged about 165 170 miles a week of running and i went into the race with the intentions of breaking the american uh trail record which was 1208 24 it was zach vetter's course record there and after the best day of my life i came across the finish line and 12 hours 19 minutes and 54 seconds so i came up a 11 or 12 minutes short of the American record. But I mean, for being 24 and running that time, I was just, I was thrilled. It was, it was the best day I could ever have helped for plus some. It was like a dream come true almost. I was going to say, so, so somebody who's that driven that they're running 165 or so miles a week in training and then, and then sets, how, how public was that goal? Did you tell everyone that's wanted, what you wanted to do? Or did you just keep it to yourself? I thought... I thought about making it public. Then uh, one of my best friends said, Taggart, you probably shouldn't do that since you've never ran an ultra marathon, you know, but um, I was confident because I was confident because the workouts and the long runs I was doing 
um, pretty much equal to close to a 1208 or a 1209. And, and you did, I mean, essentially you did that. You did 1219, which anybody would say is close to 1208. And the only person who beat you in the tunnel was the current, or at the time, the, the world record holder for, for the 100 yes. mile distance. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been, that must have been awesome. Oh, it was, it was, it was so sweet. It was just getting through that finish line and having my, and having my three best friends there. Everyone was just pumped up to be there that night in, in November. Immediately following that, did no one contact you and say, we'd like to sponsor you? Did you not get any calls? Um, I reached out to a few and they said I didn't have enough results. Um, I was told by people that I was told by people that, um, you know, oh, all these, all these companies are going to, are going to come after you. And, uh, a couple of them just basically said that I didn't have enough ultra marathon results. So I, I still don't have sponsors. I guess, uh, yeah, I guess they're hedging their bets and they're saying, well, maybe it was a freak result. You know, would we just have to kind of keep our eyes on this guy? Yeah. So you finished the tunnel and you've done it in a ridiculously good time. What is your next plan? What did you think? Um, what am I going to do next? Well, my next plan was to take about three weeks off of running, gain 10 pounds, and play a bunch of video games. Uh, um, so I did that. Sounds good. Sounds good. So I did that. Then um, going into the new year, I really hadn't had any plans. Um, the COVID numbers were on the rise in the U.S., and especially Illinois. And um, with being a PE teacher, a new homeowner, and just being single, I couldn't afford to go go across the country and race. You know, um, um, uh, most of my races are within a uh, three to six hour driving distance. Uh, I'd love to go race somewhere, but I just, you know, I, I've got a mortgage. So um, I thought about doing the U.S. 100K National Championship, but then that got moved back from April to September. So then around January, I'm just running on the treadmill one day and I'm scrolling through my phone and. And I look and I see that the treadmill world record is 12 hours, 9 minutes and 15 seconds. And I say, well, I can probably do that as a tune up for this fall and try to and try to hit it. So I made it public, I think, on January 4th that I was going to hopefully run under 12 hours for that day. And that's when I decided that for the next 16 weeks, I would train for the treadmill world record. So um, I was going to ask you um, how you came to use Zwift to, to uh, run with during your 100 mile attempt, but we've already talked about the fact that you were cycling on Zwift at one point. What got you into Zwift? How did you hear about Zwift in the, in the first place back, back when? Back when I was in college? Oh, man. Um, it was around that 2017 mark when uh, Zwift was really hitting, uh, really hitting like triathletes and cycling. And um I was at I was at college triathlon nationals and I think they had a demo or something and um, you could sign up for Zwift for free for like a month and uh, once I did it I didn't even have a smart trainer at the time I've got a kicker now but uh, I signed up and I just started riding and I was like this is insane this can completely tra change my training I don't have to go outside anymore I can just I can ride in here I can crank watts in my apartment and just be safe you know. And it was just a huge game changer for me. And uh, my last year in triathlon training, I have it recorded that over 95% of my cycling training was inside. And when did you first start running on Zwift? I didn't start running on Zwift until this, this past year, uh, pretty much, uh, when I was looking for different platforms to use for the 100-mile race. Um, I... I I didn't really think it was as big as what it was when I got on Mayfield for the first time and I saw there were 50 people on there. I was like, oh, there's there's more people on here than what I expected. And um, because I wasn't cycling, I didn't I didn't I didn't like renew my subscription. And, and I thought Zwift running would cost money, but it's completely free, which is awesome for any runner, ultra runner, you know, who who uh, wants something that's a little more social for them. So I was like, okay, well, this is this is free to do, and it's something that's halfway, in, you know, that that you can focus your mind on rather than just your steps on a treadmill. Why didn't you just use a YouTube videos or you know Netflix or? I have tried to watch videos while running, and it just takes my concentration away. I I, I don't know what it is. Um, I can't watch videos. I can't listen to podcasts. Um, it's got to be it's got to be like either Zwift outside or music. 
there's 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 nothing uh, i i just can't do movies i've tried so many times and and i spend hours on a treadmill a week and i just can't do it why do you spend hours on a treadmill each week i know i did read the article about you in uh, canadian running magazine um and uh, i thought it was interesting what you were saying about why you do run on a treadmill a lot can you explain that to people so um i think I- I think running and triathlon and just in general, you know, everyone calls it the, the a treadmill, you know, people runners still look at the treadmill, like cyclists used to look at the trainer a lot, I think. So, um, I, I really adapted the trainer in my triathlon training and I learned to love it. And, um, I knew I had to do the exact same thing with the treadmill to be safe, to prevent injury and all this stuff, because, because the treadmill absorbs all that shock. And that's how, you know, I've been able to run so much every single morning on the treadmill and the afternoons outside because I'm not pounding. It's it, it's it is flexing for me. And um, I just think as runners, if we're able to change that mindset that it's not the treadmill, it's a it is a training tool that can improve us. You know, everyone will get injured less. We'll start running faster. All that good stuff. I did, I, I did all my training. I, I had three fans on me. I had music blasting, Zwift. I mean, I got my nutrition. I don't have to worry about anything. You are still focused on running as well. So you've got something in front of you, which is entertaining to a degree. You've got a bit of social, if you want it, chat to people or whatever. You've got runners running around you, but essentially the core of it is that you're still focused on your running. Um, even more so to some degree, because rather than looking down at your watch, you've got your stats on the screen as well. So if you want to see what your heart rate's doing, or if you want to see what your average pace is, it, it's it's right in front of you as well. So it, it's kind of distracting, but also focusing at the same time. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, uh, definitely for sure. Uh, 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 dur- uh, uh, during during the one hundred mile run, I mean, I didn't really ever have to look away of the screen because. Um, unless unless someone was wanting to talk to me i mean i just kind of stay focused on the screen you know just my avatar and uh and uh, the splits on the side of the screen and what were you thinking about for 12 hours well no 11 and a half hours let's say for 11 and a half hours the same thing that i thought about for the 16 weeks i'm going to go break this record and there's not that and and the only person stopping me was myself i mean i mean i fully believe with endurance sports all it takes is all you're willing to give. And that's, that's just kind of my motto. I mean, I, I mean, I had fun. I talked to people, I enjoyed myself, but, um, you know, around that mile 30 mark, uh, the chatter kind of stopped and it's time to lock in. I've got 70 miles ahead of me and I just did my best to stay focused on my running, you know, just putting one foot front the other and doing my best to eventually, uh, break a world record. Uh, tell me about nutrition. Um, because it's uh, the main reason why people DNF in these sorts of things. Um, are you a gels guy? Do you keep sh- do you keep sugar going in, or do you uh, are you fat burner? What do you do? I have a very um, high carbohydrate based diet. I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. So um, in races, I rely on carbohydrate. Every two miles, I would have what's called a salt stick chew. I would have two of them. That's like fifty milligrams of salt, uh, just because of the heat in there. Um, the last three hours was over 80 degrees in the bar that I ran in. So it was very hot. Yeah, it was very hot. Um, as far as regular nutrition, I would rotate between four things. Um, a, either chocolate or vanilla goo, a honey stinger waffle, a cliff black chew or a banana. So, um, I would have one every four miles. So every about 28 minutes. I'd eat one of those. Um, whenever I experienced tightness in my legs, like a cramp, I would drink about three ounces of pickle juice and I would take an extra uh, salt capsule. Then at uh, past the 50 mile mark, my capsules change from just regular capsules to ones with added caffeine in there. And I didn't have a stomach issue the whole day. I actually didn't go number two at either Tunnel Hill or during the treadmill. Um, I know what my body needs. I'm not afraid to take an extra gel and I'm also not afraid to uh, hold the gel off for a mile. You know, there were, there were twice during the treadmill run where I took two gels right back to back. But how do you know that you, how do you know that you have, that you know what your body needs after just, just two 100 mile ultra runs? Because 
For most people, they would say it takes years of experience, years of running these ultras and throwing up everywhere and, and, and dying a, de a horrible death two thirds of the way through the race and walking it in at the end before they finally get some idea of, of how their body works and what to use. What, what have you been doing to, is it triathlon? What was it? It was triathlon, um, focusing on the Olympic distance and eventually 70.3, you know, and a 70.3, most of those races are between four and four and a half hours. And, um, I wasn't a marathoner who was a fast marathoner coming into ultra. I was a fast triathlete who was coming over into ultra where, um, where, um, I had a background of carbohydrate, electrolyte, uh, magnesium, salt, and all that. And, and I found out in my training runs that, um, that my stomach's a little more sensitive, you know, than cycling uh, versus running. But um, I just kind of experimented pretty much every Saturday or Sunday when I was doing a long run in my build up to Tunnel Hill and my build up to my treadmill, I practiced it. I would take in the exact same nutrition that I did on race day to where there was absolutely nothing new and I knew how my stomach and my gut would react. It is fascinating. It, it's fascinating because you, you speak with such maturity about running at such a young age with such a, I was going to say a lack of experience, but I mean, you have got experience, but the fact of the matter is you've only done, you've only done 200 milers, but, but the, the way the, in which you speak about nutrition, the way in which you speak about pacing your race, uh, your running and the way in which you talk about your goals, uh, speaks of a an older, wiser man than is sitting in front of me in Illinois right now uh you better you better not let my mom or my friends hear that so that's why i'm <laughs> um just, just between you and me yeah yeah um i've just always done my research on running you know um i'm not afraid to ask questions i'm not afraid to go look up stuff uh to see what other people have done and adjust it to me uh with anything as far as triathlon and ultra in a big endurance event what uh, works for you might not work for me and what works for me might not work for another guy you know you just honestly have to understand, you know, what it takes for your stomach to handle stuff and how to train, you know, on race day, I woke up at like 2 a.m. because because I knew I needed to drink this amount of coffee to go to the bathroom and that um, I knew that the caffeine and the coffee would wear off at a certain time. And that's when I would take in my breakfast and my breakfast would digest by the time I lined up. And I, I it's just. It's just really understanding yourself and your body to uh, be able to have a successful um, ultra endurance event. You know, you, you got to fine tune with yourself, I suppose. Let's just change tack for one second um, and talk about uh, technical uh, things, because uh, a lot of Zwift runners are very keen uh, on, on our gadgets. We all love our, uh, our watches and our uh, treadmills and our heart rate monitors and our foot pods. Um, what was your technical setup for your 100 mile uh, run? So in front of me, I had an 80 inch flat screen LG TV that was at the bar. It was great to look at all day. I'll tell you that. Um, on my feet, I had a stride pod, just, uh, just as normal. Um, I, I don't ever actually use GPS. I just use the stride pod because I trust it for distance over GPS because that could be off. On my, watch, on my watch, I had my Garmin 945 like usual. I love it. It plays music. It can hold like a thousand songs. Um, it's probably never failed me here, right here. It's always on me. Um, I don't wear a heart rate monitor. Never have, never will. Um, I can just tell by myself when I'm this, uh, this kind of goes back to like uh, understanding your body. You know, I can understand how to run slow, how to run medium, how to run fast, you know. Um, so I, so I couldn't tell you what my heart rate was all day. I could estimate that's probably 150, but I don't know that for sure. What, uh, what tre do you know what treadmill you were using to make? I used a matrix treadmill. Okay, it, cool. It, uh, it was a matrix, a commercial treadmill. I got the job done and handled me uh, fairly well. Um, I, had, I, had, I had four fans. I had one in front of me, two to the side, one actually on my face, and I had the little fan across the treadmill. But uh, it still wasn't good enough for the heat there that day. But Sure. Um, let's just talk about this stride for a second, because um, 
a lot of people uh, complain that when they're running on Zwift, uh, the stride foot pod gives them a slower pace than it would do it does outside have, have you experienced that at all with the stride so um i did a 75 mile tune-up on zwift with the stride and um i had zwift reading slower than what my watch was and it was my fault because i realized i didn't hit the little tool button to uh, calibrate it the uh, bluetooth that picked it up but uh but uh just like any smart trainer you have to calibrate it uh, whenever you move it and um i didn't do the calibration so uh, uh so like as far as issues like that i i didn't have any because we calibrated we calibrated the stride pod the day before and then we also calibrated it that morning so i i, I yeah i i didn't have issues did your treadmill did your treadmill uh read um all the way up to one six one kilometers no no the uh, treadmill shut off every 99 minutes so about every oh, 14 so or 14 half, <laughs> every 14 or 14 and a half miles i had to hop off and uh, go pee and basically came back i didn't mind it at all it was nice to have the break honestly so um have you have you um made any uh moves to get the the time ratified at all would it, do you think it would be allowed to be to be recognized yes um officially yes um i'm going through with the guinness book of world records for that um i i am filling out the information and sending in the video of the run and everything from the live stream so i'm still i'm still technically awaiting it um it will probably take honestly like six weeks for the whole thing to, to be either yay or nay but um yeah, I've done I've done everything as far as that. So good. I mean, hopefully it will it will be ratified. But the, I think we're getting to a stage now where a lot of times are being run indoors and outdoors, uh, where you know the the, the 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 official Guinness guy isn't there. You know, I think it happened for Florian's one hundred k as well. But I think I think a lot of us are kind of just accepting. You know, we, we'll all know that you've got the 100 mile treadmill world record everybody mm -hmm. knows that it doesn't have yeah. to be ratified by yeah. Guinness. do you uh -huh. know what i mean we we're all we yeah. all know <laughs> okay cool so uh so you've done the 100 mile world record on a treadmill that that is yours um where do you go from there from there um i hop off the treadmill i give i tear up i give my mom a hug which was the best thing ever because I felt like it was our world record. I open a bottle. I saw the video. Yeah. Um, um, I pop a bottle of champagne and I celebrate with my closest friends and family for the next 30 minutes until I almost go into a coma. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I get done there. And now I am focusing on the overall world record, which I'm going to try to do on June 19th. I'm going to go to a race in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's called Six Days in a Dome. And hopefully I can run under 11, 14, 56 on that day. That's the plan. Um, would you say that um, you are, I mean, you are at the moment, but it, uh, are you going to concentrate fully on uh, pretty flat running? Or do you have any plans to go and do something like Western States, come over to Europe and, and do UTMB? Are those thoughts in your head at all? Oh, uh, those thoughts are definitely in my head. It's just um, where I live in Illinois, there's no trails for me to train on. So, uh, uh, so like logistically, as of right now where I stand, it makes the most sense with me working full time to only train for a flat race. You know, um, I would love, I love go to Western States. I would love to, you know, go to UTMB, uh, Hard Rock, all that stuff. But um, as far as right now, you know, the track stuff appeals to me. Uh, Spartathlon appeals to me. But um, I would definitely someday love to eventually try to get a golden ticket, you know, try to go, you know, just just uh, try to do the actual trail racing. But um, just right now, it's just it's just not in the cards for me. So hopefully someday after the OTQ, maybe that, but um, it's not right now. Sorry, what's OTQ, uh, Target? An Olympic trials qualification for the marathon oh, yeah. for the United States. And so, so the the Olympic trials. Uh, when when are they due? So they will be ran. Um, it hasn't been released yet, but I imagine it'll be like March of two thousand twenty four or February two thousand twenty four. So a ways off, but um, I still got to run my uh, qualifying time for that in the next year. But next, or I guess next two years. 
But listen, like I said, if you know, if you break the outdoor 100, you you've got to have something's going to happen. Something's going to change for you. You know, it, it really has to. I, I would have thought. Um, and just a couple more, you know, two or three more decent results on the ITRA website or so w- whichever website you use to look at your uh, ultra stats. And uh, I, you've got to have some phone calls, Taggart, surely. Honestly, um, I I still haven't had a phone call yet. I mean, I mean, other than uh, Salt Stick, who is providing me with product, um, uh, 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 them and I have a nice relationship. You know, um, I give them shout outs and everything and they provide me with stuff I need. But um, I I don't I don't have anything. I'm just I'm just a PE teacher, baseball, basketball track coach who runs. <laughs> um, have you have you had any thoughts about doing the 50 mile or the uh, the 50k world record times on treadmills or outdoors? I um I don't even know what the 50k and the 50 mile is. Um, I'm more no, interested in uh, yeah. I'm uh because of Jim Walmsley's run in January. You know I'm I think that kind of sparked a lot of people's interest in a 100k. So uh, maybe someday, a few years from now, I'd like to do a fast, uh, a, a 62.1. But um, as of right now, you know, I want to get this 100-mile world record and then kind of go from there because I have no idea what I'm going to do this fall or next year. I just got to focus on this next uh, 42 or, or 43 days of training to to achieve that goal. That's one really important thing I've forgotten to ask you, Taggart, what shoes do you wear? So uh, for Tunnel Hill, I wore the Nike Alpha Fly. Then for uh, the Treadmill 100, I wore the Hoka Carbon X2. Okay, so how do you find the uh, the Carbon X2? I found them a bit hard, actually. It, certainly compared to the Vapor Flies, which I wear a lot. Mm-hmm. So I do all of my training in the Hoka Bondi 6 and the Hoka Bondi 7. Um, I made the switch because uh, I, I think I enjoy a 4 to 5 millimeter drop. Um, I think that's kind of what goes best with my body. So that's why I chose the uh, Carbon X2 over the Alpha Fly. Um, I tried that in the next percent and the next percent was a little too, uh, was probably just a little too thin for my feet. I've got fat feet. So uh, so uh, the Alpha Fly made sense for Tunnel Hill. And then and then with me doing all my training and the Hoka Bondi, it just made sense for me to do this and the uh, Carbon X2. Cool. Well, listen, Taggart, um, it was amazing to hear about that run. And uh, I'm so glad I've got to talk to you. And it, I, do you know what? I genuinely feel like I'm talking to somebody who in five years time will be uh, regarded as one of the best ultra runners in the world. Uh, seriously. Uh, I'm not, I, you know. Thank you. I, I really, well, and I also, I also really hope so because you strike me as a really intelligent guy who's who's really thinking about what he's doing and uh and you know you've had two amazing results uh the treadmill and the tunnel uh the tunnel win and the treadmill world record uh i really wish you all the very best for the 100 mile world record as well um on june the 19th did you say june the 19th, june 19th. where's it where's it going to be where are you going to do it it is at the Pettit Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's called Six Days in a Dome. Okay, so we'll keep our I'm eyes going, out. I'm for going that. there. Yeah, I'm going there with all intentions to break it. It's gonna be. It's gonna be just like Steve Prefontaine said, a suicide pace. The only pace worth. Uh, the only pace worth running is the pace you're gonna die at. So if I'm not running 6:45 pace, then then uh, I might as well step off the track. That's Jim Wormsley, though. That's Jim. Jim Wormsley says that he he, and that's that's been my. I I'm, I'm guessing because I'm not. You know, I'm a mid packer. Elite runners have to have that mindset of, I am I am going to go for this, and if it kills me, it kills me because there's no other way to do it. Someday, um, someday, if I ever make the Olympic trials in 2024. The only pace worth running in is the pace with the lead pack because you never know. Um, even though I'm not the most naturally talented guy, I might not have a. I might. I will. I will never have a sub two ten marathon. I'll never have a sub two five marathon. But um, if I can someday hold on with those leaders, you know the uh, Galen Rupps of the world, whoever, through sixteen eighteen miles, and I fall off and die, I would rather do that than be one hundred fiftieth place in the back. That's just, that's just kind of my train of thought, you know. I, I'd rather go out with the lead pack with the with the elite pace and just do my best to hang on as long as possible because uh, because uh, you never know. With that one day, it could be it could be your it 
It just could be your day. Could be your Somebody day. could be off and you could be on and it could be your day. Absolutely. Um, so it's, it, it, it is very risky to do it because, you know, it could happen where you DNF and you just have an awful race, but I, I don't know. It's just worth it. Just in case. Fantastic. Taggart, thank you so much for uh, taking the time uh, to come and speak to me today. Um, I hope we speak to each other again. And, uh, and uh, one day we might run together on Zwift if I can keep up with you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Stephen. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I, I had fun today. Take care, Taggart. Thanks very much.